Bonjour et bienvenue. Good evening and welcome to our Jurist in Residence lecture series, Law Meets Engineering 2020. My name is Martin Mintz, Concordia's Jurist in Residence, host and organizer of this evening's event. Bonjour, je souhaite la bienvenue à tous ceux qui nous joignent à nous actuellement pour la conférence de cette série d'automne 2020, Law Meets Engineering. I personally wish to thank Concordia University for facilitating this evening and providing us a platform to discuss this evening's most interesting topic. Special thanks to Dean Murad Dababi and Associate Dean Ali Agundas for their support and encouragement. I want to thank as well our support team, Vincent, Ilana, Marissa, Zeneb, Mark from IT, and Danielle Pollock, my executive assistant for ensuring this evening's success. Before I introduce our Dean, I would like to briefly inform you as to how this evening's program will unfold. Our Dean will introduce our guest speaker, following which there'll be a Q&A period. During this evening, we encourage all participants to send questions to Q&A, and we will address them after our speaker has completed his presentation. Following the Q&A period, we will have closing remarks from our Associate Dean, Ali Agundas. It's now my privilege to introduce Dean Murad Dababi. Thank you so much, uh, Judge Mintz, for the introduction and good evening to everybody. I am Murad Babi, the, the interim dean of the Gina Cody School of Engineering and Computer Science. It is my pleasure to welcome you all this evening for this uh, uh, speaker series um, conference. Uh, let me begin by acknowledging uh, that Concordia University is located on unceded indigenous lands. I recognize that the territory that I'm on is different from the one of Concordia at this point. Nevertheless, it's important to remember that the Ghanaian Gahaka nation is recognized as, as the custodians of the lands and waters on which the university stands today. Uh, Jujage, Montreal is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is the home of a diverse population of indigenous and other people. We respect the continued connections with the past, present and future in our ongoing relationship with indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. So tonight we are uh, extremely happy to host the second lecture of the Law Meets Engineering series of the year. Like the name implies, these series are law related lectures to be given by lawyers and subject matter experts geared towards uh, undergraduate and graduate engineering and computer science students, and also our researchers. These lectures address topics that we hope will be extremely useful in the professional lives of uh, our student researchers and future engineers. The topic tonight is who should get the Olympic medals, athletes or engineers. So I will introduce our main speaker in a minute, but let me first tell you a bit about how this series started. It is an initiative of Judge Morton Mintz, the Concordia's Jurist in Residence, and we are extremely proud to partner with him uh, on this speaker series. Judge Mintz has won many awards over the years. Last year, he received the John F. Lemieux Medal, which is a recognition award from the Concordia University Alumni Association. He, he was also appointed an officer of uh, the Order of Quebec. In 2018, he was appointed as a new member of the Order of Canada, as well as officer of the Order of Montreal. In 2014, he received the Prix de la Justice du Québec for his outstanding contribution to the promotion, promotion of social rehabilitation, victim support, and respect of human dignity in the dispensing of justice. Thank you so much, Judge Mintz, for being here tonight and for leading this speaker series. So now let me introduce our guest of honor tonight, Maître Richard, Richard Pang. 
So Metropound is currently counsel in the tax group as uh, Stickman Elliott. His main areas of practice include tax litigation and negotiations with tax authorities on behalf of clients, general tax advisory work and commercial and sport arbitration. Met for Richard Pound has had uh, what can only be described as uh, an extremely successful career. So let me only talk about what concerns the topic of tonight, mainly the Olympics. He is a member of the prestigious International Olympic Committee and has held the positions of vice president twice, from 87 to 91 and from 96 to 2000. He was chairman of the Olympic Games Study Commission. He was the first president of the World Anti-Doping Agency. He was chairman of the International Olympic Committee's Coordination Commission for the 1996 Olympic Games in Atlanta. From 84 to 2001, he directed all Olympic television negotiations, marketing and sponsorships. There would be much more uh, uh, to say, but in order to get on with tonight's topic, I'll maybe stop here. So on, beh on behalf of Concordia University and the Gina Cody School of Engineering and Computer Science, thank you, uh, Judge Mintz, and thank you, uh, uh, Matt Richard Pound, for being here tonight. So uh, now please uh, join me in welcoming Matt Richard Pound. Uh, Matt, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you for those, uh, those kind words. I should say that as a a graduate uh, myself of what is now Concordia. Uh, I did it so long ago, it was still Sir George Williams. It's, it's great to see the, this kind of a, an initiative and, and uh, we, I think the university is very lucky to have uh, Judge Mintz as, as the jurist in residence and, and to undertake introduction of, of other disciplines to the law and, uh, of the society in which they're going to be operating. So it's a, it's a great program and it's a, I'm delighted to be here and I hope uh, we have an enjoyable uh, evening. Maybe what I could do is start with sort of summarizing a little bit about the Olympic Games and then we can look a little more deeply into some of the, the particular aspects of it that, uh, that will appeal in particular to engineers. So the Olympic Games are one of the most complex events on the face of the planet today. Um, at the Olympic Games, at the Summer Games in particular, 11,000 athletes from 206 countries uh, live together and compete in some 30 sports or disciplines over a very concentrated period of 17 days. Uh, the athletes are supported by tens of thousands of coaches, medical and sport personnel, plus an infrastructure of very sophisticated technology, transportation, and security. The, the sporting outcomes of an Olympic Games um, are watched by audiences that are measured in billions. This does not occur by accident, and nor at the hands of the faint of heart. As an, as an overview, um, and, and as we consider some of the no-fail elements that must be put in place before the athletes can perform at the Olympic Games, uh, when doing something of this nature, it's, uh, it's occasionally amusing to turn the tables around and to look at the Olympics from an entirely different perspective of the, the traditional athlete-centered uh, experience. So th this evening, we're going to take the uh, perspective of engineers. And by the time we get to the end of this program, I'm sure that many of you in the audience will be wondering why we waste all these Olympic medals on the athletes when it's the engineers who really uh, deserve them. In fact, something as complicated as the Olympics could not even take place without engineers. Think of the facilities and stadia that have to be designed and built to particularly exacting standards with tolerances uh, going to millimeters, such as in uh, swimming pools, the distances that have to be calculated for jumps and throws, the banking of, a, of an indoor cycling uh, uh, velodrome, all of these things are, are call for very, very precise uh, engineering uh, activities. Think also of, of the, the, again, a no fail design, construction and delivery program of 
in the case of Tokyo, 43 different sport venues, an Olympic village, media centers, an international broadcast center, all of which involve in, over and above the engineering components of it, intricate scheduling and coordination uh, over and above the, uh, the pure engineering. As, as an example, the games, the summer games start at eight o'clock p.m. Tokyo time. They were scheduled to start on July 24th, and but for the COVID, uh, they would have. And, and it's eight o'clock, it's not 8.05, and it's not Saturday. It's gotta be uh, done right then and there. So I remember it, back in Montreal, we barely made it. In fact, I, the, you know, the big mast on our stadium wasn't finished at that point, but that was perhaps lucky because you needed our, uh, natural turf back in those days to play the, the, the football matches and some of the uh, uh, other events. Uh, in Athens, I remember in 2004, I was, we'd had a meeting in Athens and we went out to see the, the new main stadium that was being built. And we got there and, and uh, there was a, one or two workmen fastening the sort of the plastic seats onto the posts that were in the, in the concrete of the stadium and screwing them on and so on. And I looked and there was you know, maybe three or 4,000 of these things already done in, in a 60,000 seat stadium. And so I said to the, the, the foreman, I said, uh, listen, are you guys gonna be ready for August 16th? And he said, uh, August 16th, what's that? I said, that's the start of the Olympics in Athens. The opening ceremony is going to be in this stadium. Oh, he said, uh, what time on August 16th? And I said, well, eight o'clock. We oh, said, oh, we'll be ready for uh, eight o'clock. So <laughs> that's, that's how close some of these things get. But think also of the, the, the timing and measurements that, that go to thousands of seconds in track and field, swimming, speed skating, sports of that nature. Uh, I remember in 2006 in, at the Winter Games in, in Torino, there was a speed skating race where the, the difference between the gold medal and the bronze medal was six one thousandths of a second. So in that space of time, somebody came second uh, rather than first or third. And the same is true in, in events like bobsled, where you have four runs down these precipitous uh, courses. Uh, that is certainly not something for the faint of heart. And at the end of the four races, you know, the results are based on the total time. And sometimes the differences between uh, first and second or any particular uh, placings are, are measured in hundreds of seconds after four runs. So it's, it's, really, uh, uh, it's really pretty critical. And add to that, that all of this has to work perfectly and the first time. You can't have a situation where somebody goes to the the next Usain Bolt after the 100 meters and says, uh, golly, uh, what, what a fantastic race. It's unbelievable. Uh, but would you mind doing it again? Because our timing system didn't work. So think also the, of the sophisticated equipment uh, that's used for events like the pole vault. Remember when I was at the Olympic Games, they, they were still using bamboo. Then it went to steel and now they're fiber type uh, poles uh, sort of launch uh, the athlete uh, into the air at, uh, I think they're now at something over 20 feet, uh, 20 feet is, is the world record. Uh, for the throwing events, the javelins are specially designed and so forth. The hammer throw is made as a, uh, streamlined as possible. Bobsleds are very sophisticated uh, pieces of equipment. Uh, as our skis nowadays, you know, the old wooden skis that uh, people started off on and in the early days of the Olympics are now um, scientific marvels of, of uh, artificial materials and so forth. Skates, the, the skates of both for hockey and, and uh, for speed skating are, are extremely complex these days. The helmets that sometimes mean the difference between uh, 
a very serious injury and, and one that is not so serious are, are works of art. The cycles for the cycling are very, very uh, complex uh, machines now and very light. Uh, the shooting events have, if you've ever seen some of the the, uh, the pistols and the rifles that are used in shooting events, they, they practically are, are so custom made that you, your fingerprints are, uh, are on them. Uh, the competitive archery equipment now, where you're shooting 70 meters at, uh, at very small targets, rowing shells, uh, you know, the big eight uh, shells, and, the, and then the differences between those and the, a single uh, shell are, are each, each piece of equipment uh, is in effect a, a, an, an engineering masterpiece. As to the sites, um, you know, think of the design and, and construction of specialized sites like uh, Bob and Luge runs, those tunnels of ice that are very, very carefully banked uh, to make sure that people don't go off the course. Uh, the ski jumps are hugely engineered now, and, and they're much, much bigger than uh, they used to be. The, the main event now is a is a 120 uh, meter tower, and you're, you're spending something like uh, close to 300 feet in the air. Uh, once you, if you're crazy enough to go over it, once you go over the, the edge. The cross-country skiing courses uh, are specially designed. And uh, if, it's, if it's the variation of cross-country skiing that turns into biathlon, where you need the, the cross-country course, you also need places where the shooting can occur and where you do the penalty laps and so on, all of which have to be placed in and made part of the the terrain that's that's uh, being used. Certainly, uh, you know, at the start of the Vancouver Games in 2010, on the day of the opening ceremonies, um, a, a loser uh, was killed. And whether, whether, whether it was course design or a combination of course design and and his experience is, is not presently known, but uh, the fact of the matter is that he was on this uh, course and uh, got killed. So now you get to the games. Uh, what, what are other things that, that people are, are familiar with at, at, at games? Certainly spectators have a very visceral understanding of tickets. Uh, during the summer games these days, you know, there are several million individual tickets that uh, are required. Winter games are are somewhat uh, less. But somebody, when you think of it, has to configure the sport venues, work out the schedules, work out the seating plans, calculate the, the pricing, the design, and the uh, creation of the tickets, has to arrange for the sale and distribution of them, and the collection of the, of the funds, and, and all of the things that go with making a particular uh, event possible and, and enjoyable for the, uh, the for the spectator. But tickets are, are in the end, a, a very small fraction of, of less than 1% of uh, the overall Olympic audience. More than 99% of the people who experience the games do so via television uh, or some other electronic platform, but, but not by putting their seats uh, in a in a, a seat in the in, in the stadium. So if you look at television, which is the big uh, communication means, uh, Tokyo this year would have been, next year will be watched by more than 4 billion people throughout the world. That's a, think of how many people <laughs> that is. And uh, how does it happen? Well, first of all, it, it in, involves a hugely complex and sophisticated system to capture the images and the sounds from every single game or event. Thousands and thousands of hours over the 17 day period of the games. And this is done by expert creative and uh, technical personnel, some doing their work from the, uh, the actual field of play or, or nearby the field of play and others from fixed camera positions that uh, have been carefully 
designed and selected and installed in advance to have the best perspective of whatever the particular event or part of the event might be. Now, all these signals, once captured, are instantly transmitted to an international broadcast center, sometimes referred to as the IBC. And at the IBC, they are accessible to all of the rights-holding broadcasters who have bought rights to televise the games in their territories. And they retransmit those uh, images to their home territories. And they can do that either in real time, that is to say, as it happens, or after some fairly slight delay, but uh, you know that depends on what what the, what enhancements might be added to the signals at the time. But they have all have studios in the International Broadcast Center where they can do uh, the editing, uh, and and sometimes they do it uh, at home. Sometimes they do it in the IBC, and, and a lot of that may depend on the time differences between, in this case, Tokyo and, and whatever their home territory is. Uh, but the kinds of enhancements that, that uh, can go into it and, and which make the Olympic broadcast so special uh, will include interviews with perhaps with the athletes, and perhaps with the, the parents or, or uh, of the athletes if they're there, it could include background on the particular sport or event. Uh, that might include past performances of the the hundred meter men's hundred meters. So, you know, you, from Rio, or you, you, you'll you'll show Usain Bolt and and so forth. Uh, in the women's events like the four hundred meters, Kathy Freeman in in Sydney was you know one of the first Indigenous uh, Australians to win. An Olympic gold medal. In fact, she was the the one who was the final torchbearer uh, just before the it was the big stadium flame was lighted. Uh, there may be slow motion excerpts of, of the event that has just been uh, filmed. There could be replays, could be analysis of the strategy and the and the technique, uh, and and other commentary. So it, the 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 broadcast become a very sophisticated storytelling for uh, a, a worldwide audience, you know, the major portion of whom will not be experts in the particular sport or events. And, and so whatever you can do to make that a, a more real and visceral engagement with the Olympics is, is something that is, is very important. For uh, operational purposes, you know, something like uh, an Olympic archive that you plug into to get the, the pictures of uh, Usain Bolt from from Rio de Janeiro require a huge amount of uh, preparation and, and accurate logging so that the material can be instantly available and accessible by the rights holding broadcasters to plug right into their their own uh, broadcasts. The uh, International Broadcast Center itself is a very sophisticated uh, business uh, to assemble and wire the IBC requires months of preparation. In fact, one of the, the concerns we have at the IOC uh, because of the arising out of the new the schedule for the summer games, the, the postponement by a year in Tokyo, is, 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 is it going to be possible to get all of that wiring and, and, and equipment and, and uh, uh, stuff from Tokyo to Beijing, installed, tested to, to make sure that there, it's a no-fail issue, only six months after the Tokyo Games finished. It's going to be a very, very close run uh, thing, and then there may, be, may have to be some redundancy built into that. But to give you some idea, if you're, if you're ever in an Olympic broadcast center where the, the main control the room is with all of the screens and all of the, the access to the dialogue and background material and, and the actual um, events that are being um, uh, competed in, it, that, that center makes uh, NASA look like a kindergarten class. It's a, it's a very, very uh, sophisticated and, and expensive 
um, center to maintain. And we've become much better over the years now that uh, the IOC itself has taken over the the production of the television signals. Uh, we, we thought, you know, if you move the games around the world as, as we've decided that we should do, sooner or later, usually sooner, you're going to give the games to a country that simply doesn't have the sophistication and the technical ability to put on the game. So in order to make sure that the games do go on and are done properly, we thought we should do it ourselves. And it, there's, there's something in it for us as well, because the better the games are, uh, the more our rights holding broadcasters are willing to pay for the, for the rights. So it's, it, it's a, it's a win-win uh, situation. Over the years, uh, I have to say that uh, the Olympic television has been in the vanguard of, of sport uh, broadcasting. And Olympic audiences around the world have, have uh, very ambitious expectations regarding the quality and the coverage of games. And indeed, as I say, the Olympic sport coverage has, has driven uh, a lot of the worldwide sports uh, coverage uh, improvements and, and enhancements. Uh, there are specialized cameras. Uh, there are cameras that go from above the water to, to under the water in, for events like swimming and diving and, and water polo. Uh, there are, you're now able to have continuous coverage, technically of, of uh, events like alpine skiing. You know, it used to be for many, many years, you, you could only see portions of the, the downhill. Uh, for example, but now you can see the whole thing as a result of the technical advances. Same is true of, of the bob and luge runs and, and uh, so forth. Uh, little things like putting cameras in the, in the back of hockey nets or soccer goals so that you, you get a different um, perspective of uh, how fast things are moving and how uh, quickly they, uh, they certainly uh, change. But sky cams, mobile cameras, uh, we've got suspended cameras. Uh, hey, well, one example that might appeal to the, the engineers or future engineers among you is, is think of a rowing course, which is 2000 meters, two kilometers. And if, if you're there at, uh, sort of watching it live and you're at the finish line, you, you see little specks way, 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 you, you can't hear and, and you know, gradually they get a little bigger and bigger and finally, you, you get to see the last 100 or 200 meters of the race in, in any kind of uh, an exciting format. Well, now, what, what they, they do, they put a, a tower in the ground at one end of the course and another uh, past the finish line. The other so it's about two and a half kilometers. And they string that up so that there will be a camera on the, the cable that is then... Um, attached at, at, at both ends of the uh, uh, the towers and and uh, it, it has to be uh, you know, able to uh, have sufficient power to catch the event to transmit it to the international broadcast center in real time as, as the the race is going on but but imagine the engineering of, of you know how to get that those towers up and stable enough to uh, withstand wind conditions that may change, strong enough to support two and a half kilometers of cable and uh, all of the electronics that go into making sure that the, the cameras uh, are, are able to transmit both the visual uh, aspects of it, but also the, the sound of the, uh, of the uh, boats as they're being uh, uh, coming down the course. So as far as the, uh, the sophistication of things, I, I remember that in, in the United States, uh, ABC covered the Olympics for a, a number of years uh, in a row. And all of the enhancements they were doing for, in the Olympic sports were transferable to others, uh, as, as you can imagine. But they used their Olympic budget to buy all of the equipment that they would use for the next four years. You know, in those days, the, both the summer and the winter games were in the same year. We split them 
um, back in about 1994. But the Olympics paved the way for enhanced sport coverage for three years and 11 months out, out, of, the, uh, out of the four year period that, that were not Olympic. Now, coverage is, is, is one thing you, you get, uh, you get that and it's all collected in the International Broadcast Center, but then you've got to get it to the territories of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the rights holding broadcasters. And, and so we, that involves a, a complicated system of booking in advance for access to the communication satellites for, for transmission to, to the, the territories. And you know, bookings are one thing, but uh, what's important is that the satellite collection c- connections work perfectly. Now to go back to uh, the, uh, the the live audience issue, uh, as I mentioned, uh, live audiences are are insignificant numerically compared to the television audiences, but they they are significant enough to account for a huge transportation bulge that will challenge any transportation system uh, in any host country or, or host city. So if you think of the, the, the next few games, we've got Tokyo, we've got Beijing, Paris, Milano, and Los Angeles, all of which are already very busy and their resources are stretched to the, uh, the utmost to just to handle their, enormous, their, their normal uh, uh, work. So imagine what goes into ensuring that the transportation system during the games does not descend into chaos, which, which, which it has regularly done in the past. And, and uh, I can remember there used to be a standing joke after the Lake Placid uh, Olympic Winter Games in 1980 that any time a transportation um, element of uh, Olympic Games went wrong, uh, they said uh, they must have uh, hired the Lake Placid uh, Transportation Committee. And, uh, and Athens was the same uh, way. Athens was a, a, a nightmare a capital for uh, the Olympics and, and were saved only by the, the fact that uh, they commissioned a, a new airport, which was built by German engineers. And it replaced one that was widely regarded as one of the most dangerous in all of Europe. And they got a road system that allowed you to, to, to travel. My, my wife and I came in from the airport with, we, we had uh, a police car that was, we had security for ourselves. And, and these two guys got to the hotel where we were staying and they, they burst into to laughter. And we said, what are you laughing about? He said, well, before the Olympics, it would have taken us two hours get from the airport to the hotel and we did it in 23 minutes or something like that. So it, it's a, it's a challenge, but transportation wise, you know, first thing you have to do, you've got to get the people to the games and not, not just the athletes and the team officials, but suppliers, media, broadcasters, tourists, and, and others. Many of them will be coming from a long way away, especially in Japan. And that's going to require as, as anybody who's done any flying up, up until COVID is going to require particularly coordinated scheduling of flights to and from airports that are already uh, extremely busy. So when you are both on arrival and departure, the host country needs to adopt special processes to expedite entry and an eventual uh, return from the host country. Uh, For Tokyo, this is likely to be even more complicated than for a normal games because of the the, the cancellation and the, the COVID and the, the fact that by July of next year, COVID is not going to have gone away, maybe under control, but it's, it's still going to be a factor and there'll be a lot of testing and things that go with it. Then once they've got, you got them there, you've got to get them to where they're staying, whether it's a hotel or a B&B or a, the Olympic Village or private homes, whatever the arrangements are. And the question is, and somebody needs to analyze that well in advance, can the public transport systems support that kind of an influx? The answer is probably not. And that's only part of the puzzle. Uh, spectators and athletes need to be transported to training and competition sites on time, and of course, back to where they're staying. 
public transport may provide part of the solution. Certainly in London in 2012, the, the London underground system is, uh, is quite sophisticated and, and did a very good job in getting a lot of the spectators to or close to the, the competition sites. Tokyo may be the same, but uh, we've all seen videos of passengers in Tokyo being crammed into subway cars by uh, attendants. And that's under normal, normal circumstances, not, a, not the pressures of the Olympics. For athletes, it, it, you know, the last thing you want to have happen, uh, both for them and, and reputationally, is for athletes to miss their events because the transportation system failed. And, and that's, that requires generally a separate system of buses and schedules to make sure that all that uh, happens. Uh, many of the buses will not be available in, in the host country. They'll have to go elsewhere to find them. Of the, the additional buses. And uh, in, in Vancouver in, in 2010, one of the buses on which I traveled had come from Nova Scotia, driven across the country by, by its owner. And that kind of sourcing comes with its own problems. And the driver from Nova Scotia had no idea where, where the venues were located in Vancouver, or even worse, up in the mountains uh, at Whistler. I ended up being late for the opening ceremony because the bus driver got hopelessly, hopelessly lost. We had similar problems in Courchevel back in the, uh, the, the 1992 Winter Games where bus drivers, not from the Savoy area, but from Toulouse, they got lost in the mountains and were terrified by the road conditions. You know, if you're not used to driving in mountains, in snow and ice, uh, you realize that a bus is a really big motor vehicle and uh, a lot of things can go go wrong if you're not careful for hotels you got the, the olympic family as it's generally referred to needed 40,000 rooms in tokyo for the olympic period and managing that process requires systems that can operate on platforms that can handle data and funds from around the world and then over and above the olympic family you know, the regular ordinary spectators need accommodation as well and need to be able to get it. The Olympic Village, uh, probably everyone's heard about, you know, every Olympics has an Olympic Village. Uh, it's certainly a, a feature that's well known as an Olympic institution. In Tokyo, this is going to take the form of what will become a high end residential complex of some 5,000 units located in one of the most crowded centers in the world. It has to be built and configured to accommodate 11,000 Olympic athletes, plus team officials, office space, residential space, kitchens, dining halls, recreational facilities, shopping, parking, and, and many, many other features. And immediately after the games, it's gotta be reconfigured for its post-games use fixed up and, and delivered to the, uh, the eventual purchasers of the units. Let me talk briefly about cybersecurity. It, unfortunately, uh, it's in the nature of the real world in this era that there will be sophisticated cyber attacks on the operating systems used at the games. This in turn uh, requires that defensive systems be developed to anticipate and interrupt su any such attacks, as well as to design patches when the attacks are detected. And attacks of this nature can be directed at the broadcast operations, the media center. Uh, both of those then require alternate power supplies outside the, uh, the, the normal power grid so that there's a, an instant pickup if the the power grid goes down. Uh, it can affect the uh, the game's installations, so you need the security of mag and bag and other um, supervisory uh, um, work. Uh, the transportation system. I remember, there were bombs set off in the the London Underground Underground in respect to the 2012 games. Uh, there's a lot of international cooperation that, that is special to 
the Olympics, uh, the organizing committees and the security apparatus in the, the host country uh, will cooperate with security services around the world to identify threats and to maintain surveillance on potential bad guys. And what was simply crowd control in the early days of the uh, <clears throat> Olympics has gone through two paradigm shifts now. One was in Munich in 1972 with the uh, Black September uh, attack on the Israeli team. And then again, after 9-11. And, and it's in everyone's interest to, to cooperate in all of these things because at, at something like the Olympic Games, every country has some of its own citizens or nationals uh, there. And it, it's in everyone's interest to make it work. Um, Athens in, in 2004 was a, a security nightmare. It's in, it's in a dangerous location. And it has a, a big port area. Uh, in, in Piraeus, uh, which part of which was being used uh, with cruise ships to be floating hotels for Olympic uh, Olympic tourists and spectators, and the other was a, a commercial port filled filled with uh, containers, and nobody had any idea what was in those containers, and so the security there was was uh, was tremendous. They had a, and in Greece has a very porous eastern border and there's some bad guys on the other side of the, that border and it's very close to the Middle East so it was close to being a perfect storm in terms of a security risk but uh, fortunately everything went pretty well and again as uh, a couple of things just to wind up there there's an accreditation system that, that, that uh, deals with access to Olympic sites, whether it's the, the Olympic Village, some of the uh, the hotels, uh, Olympic family hotels, the, the competition and training sites, and then all that sort of stuff. And so you need a, an accreditation that identifies you as somebody entitled to be where you want to be, or somebody who does not have access to that uh, area and cannot uh, cannot get in. It's a system that, that you know, involves thousands and thousands of athletes, team officials, Olympic officials, organizing committee staff, security staff, media suppliers and, and volunteers. It's, it's very complex and it would be, they say in the hundreds of thousands of people in the system. One, one, one follow up on the tickets that I mentioned is one of the things you have to do at Olympics is, is to make sure that your, your tickets are, are printed and available but not distributed too early in order to avoid counterfeiting. And you can imagine what would happen every time two people thinking they had uh, the right ticket turn up and it's the same ticket and one's a counterfeit. <coughs> Special security uh, applies to uh, both the people and the physical venues in and around the, the host city, the airspace, the harbor, the airports, uh, you, sometimes you want to get flight paths over the city to follow events like the marathon uh, or the triathlon. All of that has to be figured out in advance and, uh, and, uh, and put in place. And overall, the security has to be a seamless operation. You can't wait for an emergency to occur and then try and figure out who's in charge of dealing with the problem. That's all got to be worked out. Uh, uh, in advance, and uh, Montreal, we had a, we were the first summer games following the Munich games. So the, the level of security was ratcheted up uh, enormously. Uh, I remember in Beijing, you had this apparently sort of benign position of, of unarmed police uh, along the routes that were uh, Olympic routes, every fifty or hundred meters. And that that was sort of reassuring in the sense that there were police there, but in the back streets, not far away, were the the major uh, SWAT team uh, vehicles and and uh, uh, officers that uh, would be available in about thirty seconds if something uh, something went wrong. In Athens, in not Athens, in Los Angeles, in nineteen eighty four, I'm talking about the security. There were fifty 
different security forces involved in protecting the, the LA games. You know, LA is pretty spread out, but that's that's how uh, important it is to make sure you get uh, uh, you get things done in Barcelona because of the the worries about the ETA, the separatist Basque threat outside the Olympic Family Hotel, you know, where the IOC president was staying and all that sort of stuff. It's a tank, and in in the turret was was a, a an armed soldier with a machine gun, mounted machine gun. So you, you didn't make any sudden movements around there, but that's the the level that uh, sometimes happens. So anyway, this is not a complete uh, Olympic inventory, but but all of these things could not happen without engineers. So and without them, there would be no Olympic Games for the athletes uh, in which to compete. So so why waste all those medals on the athletes? Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to take any questions that uh, participants may have. Okay. Hmm. Um, are there any questions that I have not seen yet, or is there anyone who would like to uh, submit a question? Okay. And she did a very thorough I think maybe everyone fell asleep. <laughs> no, I think it was just a very thorough and uh, complete, um, giving us a complete understanding of the enormity of all the Olympic Games and what goes through uh, these these uh, uh, the works that uh, are done behind the scenes. Um, if we don't have any, let's just give a little more time to anyone. There's one question. There's one question. Yes. Go ahead. I think there's one question that has been posted by Erin Lippmann. What was your reaction to Munich massacre of Israel, uh, Israeli athletes? Why did security break down for these athletes and team? What have you done to improve this? Do you honor these athletes? Thanks, Richard. You were super sooner. <laughs> well, uh, as it happened, uh, I was the, what was called the assistant chef de mission of the Canadian team in, in Munich, and and our building was was the next one over from where the Israelis were, and we were we were in the office, uh, you know, sort of planning the day, and uh, one of our team managers said he was going to go out for a, a run. We said, "All right, we'll see you later." And say about. Two minutes later, he's back. And he said, well, you must be really fit. You lasted almost two minutes. Oh, no. He said, there's, there's something going on over there. Some guy with a gun told me to get back inside. And so we were trying to figure out what that was. And, you know, the media in, in those days was not as, uh, as quick and, and not as well equipped as it is now. So it took a, a long time to find out that there, there had been an incident uh, in the Olympic Village, and and that involved the Israeli team and the, and um, it's a, a terrorist group, and so uh, we were sort of following it as best we could uh, on the media. But uh, the the question that was the interesting question is why was that so easy? And the answer was because there'd never been anything of that nature uh, affecting the Olympic Games, and and so there was a there was a a fence, you know, probably a, a three meter fence or something like that around the village. And um, so the, these terrorists got dressed up like athletes in, you know, track suits and whatnot. And, and uh, in the middle of the night, they just climbed over. They, they knew they had done enough work to know where the, the, the quarters were. And, and uh, they got in and they were, they were there before, really before anyone knew it. And there was a, there, there was a, some initial resistance, and they killed a couple of the uh, the uh, athletes or team team officials, and then and kept the others uh, um, under sort of lock and key. Uh, it was for for a lot of the people there it was uh, we weren't sure what the the result was going to be, and I mean the German authorities were negotiating with the uh, with the with the terrorists, and then eventually they got a. Uh, an agreement that they would fly them out to some neutral country and they 
they got out to the airport and I think the Germans were so mortified that, you know, this happened to an Israeli team in, in Munich, which had a very unfortunate uh, connection with the, uh, with the war. And they decided that they would stage a, a rescue operation, uh, which went bad and, and they were all killed. So uh, there has, there certainly has been a, um, a regular, it's not really a celebration, but a recognition of, of that event and, and uh, how unfortunate it was and how we don't want it to happen again. So uh, I can tell you the, the security levels uh, in and around uh, Olympic installations uh, has, has gone up enormously. Uh, in, in Montreal in 1976, the first games after that, uh, you know, the Canadian Armed Forces we're also involved in, in maintaining security and, and uh, maintaining separation and, and distances from uh, Olympic installations. So it's, it's a much different game now played by much more, uh, much more expert uh, defenders, uh, you know, the bad guys get better and you, you have to respond to that. And, and so we've, we've done it. And I think that, uh, at every Olymp issue of the Olympic Games since Munich, I think there has been a, a celebration of, of some sort to, to recognize what happened. So we hope it never happens again, and it's unfortunate it happened in the first place. I have a question from uh, Mai Kwan Go. Nego. What the biggest challenges are and negative as a result of the postponement of the Tokyo Olympics? I, the, the biggest challenges will be whether the, the uh, COVID-19 will be under sufficient control that you can have stadia filled with the, the usual number of spectators. And we, we don't know that yet. And it's a, it's a very frustrating uh, situation to be in. I mean, not only for the people that bought tickets and they want to they want to use them, uh, but also for the organizing committee that they can't honor all the tickets. They've got to come up with probably something in, in the order of uh, $400 million of uh, refunds. So, there, so there's that. The other is even if the pandemic is, is under good control, as it seems to be in Japan, that's only one country out of the 206 what 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 is the state of the of, of COVID in in India and Brazil and the United States and, and other countries? Are are they going to be able or allowed to, to travel? And in the preparation period, depending on how bad things are, you know, if you're in Montreal and we're in a red zone now, you can't practice sport. Uh, you know, pretty, I mean, you can you can run on the street or something like that. But if you're if you're a wrestler or a boxer or a, playing in a team sport you can't practice uh, well enough. So, you know, we're looking to try and create bubbles where, where uh, teams can do this. Uh, the, I'd say the most encouraging thing in all of that is, is probably that some of the sports, uh, high level sports have been able to ha have their events without the crowds at the same level. So we've seen golf, we've seen uh, cycling, we've seen uh, baseball, we've seen tennis. So I think we're, we're looking, pretty closely at, at those best practices to see which of them uh, are, are transferable to uh, events uh, such as the Olympics. But uh, there's that, and then I had mentioned the, you know, can we get all of the stuff from Tokyo to Beijing and installed in a six month period instead of the 18 month period that we thought we had before that we postponed the games. So that's, that's a few things that, that uh, are, are major issues for us. Um, question from Sergei Garguan. Have you seen a permanent improvement in the infrastructure of the host country or does the newly created or the improved infrastructure is forgotten with time? It, it, that's a mixed um, situation. There, there are some uh, cities who have planned very carefully in advance for, for the post games use of facilities. And, and we've always encouraged the, the host cities, look, 
if you don't need it after the games, don't build a permanent facility. You know, build a, a temporary facility and, and and take it down. It costs you half as much to build it uh, temporarily as, as permanently, and there's no subsequent maintenance. And an example was it was in in Alberville for the Olympic Winter Games in 1992. Alberville said we don't, we don't need a 40,000 seat stadium. We'll, we'll never use it. And so we said build a temporary one. So they they put that up, took it down, and it, was, it worked uh, very well. Others are, you know, in Athens, uh, I mean, the Greeks are, are, are toxically in love with, with the Olympics uh, as a concept, and uh, but they don't like all of the Olympic sports. And so there were, there were things for, for karate and, and other sports where, you know, they had to do them because there were events, uh, or, or judo events, rather, not karate. They had to do it, but, but they really had no particular interest in them. And so that there's, that there's sometimes a bad rap there. Uh, you know, in Montreal, the, uh, the cycling velodrome is, is, you know, now the biosphere and the, the Olympic uh, track and field stadium was, was configured for baseball. That was part of the deal that Montreal made with Major League Baseball, that they would, they would have a co- covered stadium because otherwise there were no baseball games in, in April in, in Montreal because of the weather. So it's, it's really a question of, of planning. And uh, the, the better you plan the backswing, uh, the, the better the outcome will be. Question from Shaheen Karimi Dorabati. Based on your experience, what must be done from the engineering perspective to have the Tokyo Olympics a successful event considering the COVID-19 conditions? Well, I, I would say, I mean, it, I think it's quite important for Japan as a country that these games be successful. I mean, they've had a bad period of six or eight years with the tsunami and the, the, the nuclear thing. And, and this, this would be a, a symbol of, of uh, the resilience and the recovery of, of, of Japan from all of these disasters. And I think around the world, if you can get all of the young people the Olympic athletes to, to the games and, and they go off um, successfully, wh- whether or not the stadia are full, that too is a sign of, of resilience and, and, and uh, sort of not, not, getting, uh, not getting destroyed by this terrible uh, pandemic. So there are lots of things that, that will, will go to that success. And, and I think the Japanese have been, we've been very lucky. They, they, they had a an absolutely first-class organizing committee with, with seasoned professionals for drawn from, you know, sort of on contract from uh, other industries and organizations in Japan. So it was, it was really well organized. And I think the, the legacy will be not only in terms of facilities, but also in, in, in the general morale of, of, the, of the country. They had post games use all figured out for all of the stadia, and that was one of the early problems when we postponed it. They had to go to the 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 presumptive owners and occupiers who who were expecting to take possession of the facilities in September of this year, and say, "Listen, we need them. We need them next year." And and what what kind of arrangements they had to negotiate uh, for for that, I they haven't made public, but. They've secured all 43 of the uh, the competition sites, so uh, th- those will all contribute to uh, what I think will be successful games if we, you know, if if the COVID lets us do it. Uh, question from uh, Benam Shobiri: Can you explain a bit more about cybersecurity defenses that are in place during the games? Any special cyber attack case that you could explain? Well, um, you have to understand, I'm a, a tax lawyer, and it's all I can do to get Zoom to work. So I don't know what the specifics are, but I do know that, uh, and, and some of you may remember if you watched the, the 2018 Olympic Winter Games from uh, Korea, that in the middle of the opening ceremonies, some of the systems went down, and, and they were traced back to some of the usual uh, suspects. 
So they got things up and running pretty quickly, but you know, now we're more attuned to the kinds of things that could happen. You know, if the power grid goes out, it's almost never an accident in, in these cases. So the, the security has to, and first of all, identify the possible threats, identify the possible um, bad guys, uh, what is likely to be the, the, the entry point and, and all of that sort of stuff. And, and that's where people who really know the, uh, the computer business, the, uh, the, you know, the, the electrical engineers and, and things like that are, are the ones that are, are involved in that. And there's a, lo a lot of communication between the national security institutions as, uh, as well as the organizing committee. So the defense is, is sophisticated, but there are a lot of smart people out there that uh, spend their lives trying to hack their way into places that they shouldn't be. All right. I think uh, given that our time um, framework that we've always tried to respect, uh, we are, you know, at the end of this evening. And uh, if Ali is there to... I'm here, yeah. Make some closing remarks, uh, that would be great. Thank you, Judge Mans. Uh, Richard, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Uh, as always, it was wonderful to have one of uh, Judge Mans' um, guests. Uh, I mean, Olympics is always inspiring. We are all basically in love with Olympics, Olympic sports and so on. But the details, inside information you provided today is really amazing. And just going in front of the TV and watching those wonderful events is one thing. But knowing how do everything is just falling uh, and coming in front of you is something else. And uh, it was really exciting. I uh, truly enjoyed and I'm sure our students enjoyed as well. Thank you very much for being here with us. And once again, Judge Mins, thanks a lot for contributing to the, these events. And thanks for inviting such wonderful speakers. And it was really a lovely evening. And uh, I would like to thank uh, everybody for joining. Um, as many of you know, we will continue having these events. And within a month, most of you uh, most likely are in our uh, email list you will receive another announcement. And I'm sure that uh, Judge Mintz is going to invite another wonderful uh, speaker. And hopefully uh, in a month, uh, we'll see you again. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. Thank and you for the invitation. Thank you so much, uh, Metro Pound. But we didn't get the answer. Who got the medal, the engineer or the... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, you organize the election and let me know how it comes out. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you so much. It was very insightful uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you.